I'm hearing you loud and clear. Yeah. Prof, I agree to. Ah, Doc. How now? No, God, but you know. We do. How are you doing? I hear you. I yeah. Thank I you. you. <laughs> Uh, and this say you will see the mosque here. Yeah. <laughs> I came back mosque. early. Because you told yes, me to come. I didn't stay to the mosque today. I just came back early. <laughs> oh, oh, Allah will hear your supplications to him. Amen. <laughs> <laughs> we hear all of us. <laughs> all of us. Amen. 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 Doc, good to see you. Oh. Just one minute to go before we start. Docs, you're looking very relaxed today. <laughs> you hear me? Docs, can you hear me? Good afternoon, distinguished panelists. Uh, uh, good afternoon, delegates. Yeah, My name is Tobena Erojikwe, and I'm the chairman of the Board of the Institute of Continuing Legal Education. Uh, today's training is a continuation of the training on civil and uh, uh, criminal litigation which started yesterday. And I'm happy that we had quite a large number of people attending yesterday's training and the feedback has been extremely good. Um, unfortunately, we weren't able to start as, at 2 p.m. today as early advertised, but since yesterday we've been sending out word that training today will start at 3 p.m. It was likely because of Juma service that starts at two, so we wanna make sure that everybody's accommodated. Um, I'll now invite the then senior advocate of Nigeria, Tala Shobi, to introduce the topic for today and the speaker for today. Tala, I yield to you. Okay, our topics for today is basically the charge. So it's about drafting charges. And uh, we have a very distinguished um, speaker um, handling this very important and foundational topic um, in criminal litigation. The, the speaker is um, um, Professor Nasiru Aliu Adamu, S-A-N. Um, he's a very dear friend and brother to me. <laughs> and um, Professor Nasiru Adamu is a partner in the law firm of Bashir Nasiru and Co. And he's currently an associate professor of law at the Department of Public Law, Faculty of Law of Bayou University, Kano. He was a lecturer at the Nigerian Law School for 15 years, where he rose from the rank of rose from the rank of to the rank of senior lecturer. Nasiru Aliu Adamu was the lead lecturer of criminal litigation in the Nigerian Law School Kano campus for seven years and he left the services of the Nigerian Law School in 2015 as the head of Department of Professional Ethics and Skills Kano campus. Dr. Nasiru Aliu, Professor Nasiru Aliu Adamu is, is not only a university don but an active litigation litigator hence he was conferred with the prestigious and most privileged rank of the senior advocate of Nigeria in the advocates cat category. Nasir Ali Adam Wesson has published several articles in various areas of public law and public international law in both national and international journals, including articles he published in the Chinese language in the prestigious Wuhan University China School of Law Journal, Law Review, uh, law Review Journal. Nasir Ali Adam was an assistant prosecutor in the Field Banks Tribunal from 1996 to 1999. He has been the lead prosecutor of, of the Medical and Dental Council's Tribunal from 2013 to date. Nasir Ali Adamu said also quoted some textbook. He's also the editor in chief of a published book, a compendium of selected articles on cybercrime, law, and digital evidence with related legal instruments. Mm -hmm. He's married with children. Um, so my Lord, um, so I, I beg your pardon, but um, Ladies and gentlemen, it gives me great pleasure to introduce to you Professor Nasiru Adamu Aliu, uh, SAN. As we have seen from his citation, he's, I'm aware um, that he's been very active in litigation 
criminal litigation in particular, right from uh, the time he was called to the bar, where, um, and he's also been a very active defense litigator, in a, uh, yeah, criminal defense litigator. So he's worked on both the prosecution side as well as the uh, defense side uh, in criminal litigation. He was very active in the days of the failed banks tribunal. Um, and this is, we're talking 28 years ago. So he's had 28 years, over 28 years of this experience in active criminal litigation. He's been a lecturer at the Nigerian Law School in criminal law and litigation, lecturer at the university in criminal law. Um, and so he's he's seen all sides of it, from the litigation to prosecution, to defense, to lecturing and all that. So uh, it gives me great pleasure to introduce my dear friend and my dear brother. Uh, Professor Nasr Ali Adamu, SAN. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Lena Silk, uh, fellow Shabi, my dear friend, uh, Mr. Chairman, and the other co panelists, um, ladies and gentlemen, uh, colleagues, uh, good afternoon. Well, it is a great pleasure for me to be today with you to present this uh, short. Rather, it's a lengthy uh, uh, PowerPoint, but uh, I promise I will make sure that I take it within the span of the time. Now, it's basically about charges. Now, um, you see, under the topic, we have actually drafting of charges, the proof of evidence, material contents thereof. Then we'll now go down to arraignment, incidental applications, summons, motion for bail, objections to the charge, and the challenges of objection to as to the competence of a charge. Abuse of court process, that is in a situation whereby there is a charge and uh, there is an abuse of court process. Um, contempt of court and jurisdiction, that is the jurisdictional issue. Now, uh, when uh, put side by side with the provision of section 396 2 of the ACGA 2015, whereby it has brought a situation whereby In, uh, uh, objections. These are one of the challenges which we intend to just discuss here. Now, um, we are talking about not drafting a charge. Presumably that you are either a state counsel from the prosecuting agency. You are either somebody who is not given the task to draft a charge, either as a, a private prosecutor or whatever. Now, the issue is, how do you start? How do you go about it? What are the considerations that one should make in order to ensure that a charge is drafted, not only drafted, but a charge that is competent and that will be valid before a court, and then which will enable the prosecution and the defense to have their day. Now, it is very important to know that it's just like um, a building a house. There is no way you build a house without gathering materials. Now, building materials and you make sure that you get the quality materials so that you'll be able to have a quality house. So that is exactly the situation with a charge in a criminal litigation. Now, first and foremost, you know, as um, we know that certainly crimes are bound to happen in the society. Now, here comes as a crime that has happened. And now investigation has gone on and the police or anybody, uh, any of those investigative agencies have finished and they have now gathered the case diary. And now whether it is themselves that are going to prosecute or they are forwarding the case diary in accordance to the office of the AGF or AG of state, as the case may be, or like AFCC that, that are prosecuting their matters themselves. Of course, we know they are all doing subject to the powers of attorney general. Now, the first and foremost is that as a person who intends to draft a charge, there is no way you are going to draft a successful charge, a good, valid charge that has whatever it, ta it takes without mastering the facts. You need to master the facts, the surrounding circumstances of the case, and then you have to have a thorough reading and review of the case diary to have a full understanding of the case. Now, why do you have to do that? Now, for you to be able to now see from which angle are you going to come and then how to now navigate in between this case diary and then to, because you are going to put whatever work you do now before. So there will be a lot of uh, consideration. So in view of that, there is no way without clearly and uh, diligently reading, reviewing and understanding the case itself. 
Now, there, you should not leave anything undone. Everything must be taken into perspective so that you'll be able to prepare a very good charge. Now, how do you do that? The second thing is what we call the principle of isolation. The view to identify certain principal actors. I have read this fact. Am I am I back? Am I back? Prof, you are back, but where you I'm keep back. you keep seizing on and off, but you are back now. I'm back now. Am I back now? Yes, you are. We can hear you. Go ahead. Sorry. Now I, I was saying that um, um the moment that you have studied the case diary, you master the facts, and then you now start to look for where and how to navigate. Who are you going to consider? Now, who are the actual persons or things that you ought to consider? So that's why I said you now start with the principle of isolation and identification with a view to identify, one, the actual person to be charged. Who are the principal actors? Who are the likely conspirators? If any, if there is no now, who and who should have been considered as those who will be charged? Now, there is no way you're going to do that without understanding the facts, reading the scenario, and then walking through the whole instrument of uh, the police or investigation that's brought the case diary to you. Now, if you now identify the person or persons, or even people, it depends upon the nature of the case, where like a mob action or breach of peace, where you need a lot of people. Now, the case diary would have disclosed to you who the person you now try to identify, what is the offense? What actually is offense? What are the offenses? Is there a, just a single offense or many offenses? Now, that will be a, one of the starter that you have to understand so that you will know the level of the commitment that you are going to put in trying to identify um, the materials you are going to use in, in drafting the charge. Now, it is very important to know that not only you know the offense, because you have to go and read the law. You have to understand the law itself. What are the, uh, the, uh, the, 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 the likely stumbling blocks if you start prosecution? So you must put this in, you know, uh, because there's a presenting, presentation going to become on case theory. That's why I will not uh, direct the case theory. You know, it will presupposes that when you read this thing, you're going to make a case theory so that you'll be able to put your case properly. But I will not go into case theory, but I will just concentrate on this. Now, after the offense committed, now what of date and time? when the crime was committed. You know, you know, you must know time is of essence because certain time, there are certain offenses which you need to understand actual time. Let's say you want to charge the offense of burglary. Certainly you need to have clear, clear court time so that uh, at the end of the day, there will be no objection and then you may not be able to example. So it means time, date, and date is so crucial also. Why do you need to, uh, to know the date is because Possibly you could you would have been filing a charge in an offense that had already uh, become statute bad. So what can you do? It means that uh, it has expired. So there's nothing you can do. So then that is the most important thing. Then the next thing is you look at the case very carefully. Having studied it, reviewed it very very well. Now see whether the facts as contained in the case diary link the suspect with the alleged offense. Is the suspect or suspects linked? To the offense, or are they be leaked as a result of certain uh, 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 act, either accessory before, accessory after the fact, conspirator, and what have you? Then that is very important also. So if there is no linkage between the person you intend to judge and the offense, then there, there is no way you are going to succeed. You can't just draft anything because who are you going to charge? So now, when you go through the case, that is certainly you would have seen because presumably the police would have seen through. And now maybe, you know, they, you find some isolations which they would have done in their findings. They would have made mention their investigation activities. And you would have been able to know that, look, there were, let's say, 20 arrests. But eventually police were able to narrow down case on two or three persons. So now you see, are those persons actually linked? Because the police had done their duty, their work. Now it's now left for you as a, as a person who is going to drop the charge. Now, if there's a linkage, the next thing is that whether this evidence is sufficient, or what exists for the purpose of that person, that is suspect to be prosecuted. 
That could be a, a being an idea of an offense committed. That could be a hand, but it may not be necessarily necessarily that that kind of uh, evidence that will be uh, sufficient to enable you to charge the person and to prove the case. So now, if that being the case, now it means you have to have an interview, possibly with each member of the investigation team, if possible. You know, you have interviewed with them, they give you their perspective, you roll minds together, and you may be able to come out with a charge. That because there are a lot of times when police who had investigated murder can be able to give you a clue, a clue. I, I, I mean, I like I remember prosecution in medical and dental council, you know, is uh, medical uh, uh, negligence, uh, professional misconduct, and what have you. Some of those things are, are committed in the course of treatment. Now, those are the certain things that as a lawyer, you need somebody who is going to help you to navigate through. So now it means you have to now be able to interview members of the team that investigated. It's just like what I said, in medical and dental care, they have medical and dental investigation panel, which is just like a police under their act. So you need to interview, for example, the team. What are, you may be able to find one of the most crucial persons among the team that has mastered everything, and then you are going to make use of that person. Now, the next is, out of those people or, or persons in the team you interviewed, who is capable? Who is capable? You have to look at most capable witness or somebody who can be able to, if, for example, you want to draft a charge, you know, you need a proof of evidence. If it is under, for example, a, it's ACGL under most northern states, you need proof of evidence. And then, you know, uh, you have to identify the person who are going to be your witnesses. Of course, then you will be able to know who and who, and who you are going to put as a witnesses. So because they will be part on parcel of that charge. So now the next thing is, there are certainly there are certain uh, witnesses the investigating agencies would have called. Maybe uh, as somebody within the scenario where the crime the crime scene had happened, or somebody who it. Now you now have to while you plead the case there, you'll be able to see there are other witnesses called by the investigating agency, maybe the police or uh, whoever. Then you'll be able to witness them and then verify their statements, which would have been in the case diary. You know how you don't just take a risk of just taking a oh, this is quite um, a useful witness. Now, that's what they call repetitive witness. Who is a repetitive witness? A repetitive witness is that witness which he only memorized. He can only replicate and tell you, if you ask him the story today, he will give you the same story. Tomorrow he'll give you the same story that is likely to be a dangerous person that you are going to be considered because any change in the mood may create a problem. So, but you need somebody who can navigate, who can be able to use memory to say, no, 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 look, apart from that, that something that had happened, we did this, we did that. So those are the kind of witnesses which you may require to have so that you can be able to, to uh, I mean, avoid those witnesses except where it is absolutely necessary. There are certain times where you find the only remaining official witness that could be available is only one person and he happened to be a repetitive, a repetitive witness. There's nothing one can do. You have to have, you have to take him as you. Now, what is the significance of all those things that we're saying? Why do you have to make sure that you interview the witness? Why do you have to make sure that you isolate witnesses and see who and who are relevant? It's because you have to avoid unnecessary amendments and springing surprises so that you may not be even be embarrassed after a charge has been filed. Because sometimes, without verifying things, sometimes you will ask a witness, possibly had a bad memory, or possibly something would have been wrong. You will tell, no, 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 I didn't say that. That is not what it is. Now, assuming you have drafted a charge, put uh, that person as one of your witnesses, in fact, maybe relying heavily on that person, and then you come to court, and then this man starts to give you difficulty. And then you will be embarrassed, and then that means maybe you will be uh, have to be amend the charge to see whether you now, the whole thing is, the point, another thing to consider is whether even the public interest and the interest of justice will be served by even preparing a charge to prosecute a person. Where is this a mere suspicion? Why should you waste your time? Of course, the police would have done their work. They would have brought it to you. You know, you know the strength of the evidence. You ask the, the person who is going to drop the charge, you may be careful and then say, no, I may not need to uh, waste time on this thing. It's not likely. Now, the next thing is that, you know, 
in trying to drive a charge, you must know the law itself. Which under which way am I going to charge them? So you'll be able to bring the essential ingredients of offense vis a vis the facts that you are going to build in. Now you know, as we know, that in a charge, you need to give particulars. A charge must be clear and ambiguous. So that if you do that, then you can be able to okay, now how do you do that? You have to marry the fact and the law. So at, where does it suit? What what which law are you going to use? What proof do you require to prove that case? So it means you must know the law. So when you know the law, then you may be able to not draft a charge without having uh, so much amendments. Now, it is also worth you to know, actually start thinking, think, which court am I going to charge the person? Now that will help you to be able to remember because when drafting a charge, you know, there are targeted courts. So you, that will give you, in, in, that will help you in issue of formal, formal format. You know, um, these are things, we, we learned all these things in law school, but uh, it's all more, more or less here as a practical aspect of it, not the kind of uh, theorized one that we have heard. Now, it is very important now in this uh, uh, juncture to know, first of all, when we are talking of drafting charge, who drafts a charge among this class of persons? We know the police officers, special prosecutors, and magistrate attorney general. Let me go back to the issue of magistrate, where in all the ACJLs in the northern Nigeria, that the practice is different from filing a charge as it is in the southern part of Nigeria, which as it was obtainable under CPA and CPL, as it is under it was under CPC, which there are I think one or two states now that are still uh, uh, practicing under, under CPC. Now the point is that where a charge. We know it no, no, usually a charge to be filed by attorney general. We know it that the police can file a charge, special protector will file a charge. Now, that presupposes a case diary. That is the first point of contact with the prosecutor to be able to, to do those things that I said, I mentioned earlier on. So in this case, now here comes to my by it is now the magistrate who is going to drop the charge. Now, so it means there are certain different considerations that must be given. Now, here comes where a case diary would have been with the police. And although the magistrate has power to order for police to bring case diary for him to inspect. However, the first point of contact, an FIR, that is first information report, is filed before a magistrate court in the north, whereby the allegations will be stated and then it will be taken to the magistrate and the magistrate will now ask the, charge, the FIR be read to the uh, defendant there. Now, where a defendant now uh, 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 denied the contents of FR, because usually they will not say, I guilty, they will say, is that content true or not? Say, uh, your worship is not true. Then the prosecution will now say, since the defendant denied the content of FR, I, I will ask for proof. But if the defendant now uh, admitted, where the magistrate could summarily try them, so the magistrate will proceed and try that person. Now, in this circumstance, he has denied the contents of FIR. So now the duty of the magistrate now is to now ask the prosecution to lead evidence so that the magistrate will be able to appreciate the fact that the particulars of those uh, allegations contained in FIR. Now the allegations in FIR usually uh, you see the statement of like the way we have a charge, but in a different form. They will just give, like, write like a story facts and then bringing out the offenses that are alleged to are suspected to have been committed, and then the sections. And then the magistrate will now ask them to, pro, uh, to proceed and call evidence. And now the, 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 the magistrate will now ask them, okay, prove when the call witness says, if the magistrate is satisfied that there is a prima facie case against the accused person, then the magistrate will now uh, frame a charge. So now here you see the frame of charge is not the duty of the police or the duty of, is not the duty of the magistrate. So that is what is obtainable under the ACGL, uh, under the norm, so which was replaced, which replaced the CPC. Now I have given certain uh, sections of the law, like in, you know, in ACJA also, you know, because of the practice in Abuja, and now you see section 109 of ACJ dealt with the issue of a magistrate to hear uh, evidence for the purpose of framing a charge. 
Now section 129, I'm just giving Kano as an example, which is almost the same thing that uh, concerning where a magistrate will, uh, will draft a charge. Now, let, uh, it must be noted that a charge must be drafted clearly, concisely, in such a way that accused person will have notice of whatever charges is made against him or her. Now, that is why if you look at it, you know, the offenses are distinctively uh, uh, charged either under information or under charge. That is information in the south, southern part of Nigeria, in the high court, and charged in the federal high court and charged in the magistrate court, both in the north and south. If you are talking at that, then it means we, uh, we, 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 we will see that there must be forms. If, because the format of a, uh, of, of a charge and information is not the same. We know an information has the state of offense, particular offense, and then other aspects of it. I will not go into that detail, as it said, but you know, charge, you have first count, second count, for example, then information. Well, usually in the Northern Nigeria, you find first head of uh, charge, second head of charge, but sometimes you find count one, count two, count three. So these are forms, one of the forms. So I have given the law there, but uh, you know, as uh, simple as it is, that we know the contents of a charge, which must have the heading, uh, 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 the heading, the name of the court, the prosecuting authority, the name of the defendant, statement of offense, and particulars as the case may be. You know, when we are talking of charge under uh, uh, the North, is a whole one paragraph charge. And then where it is a charge in the magistrate, you know, in the North, it's a three paragraph uh, charge where it has what they call uh, 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 introductory paragraph. It has the body and then what they call directional paragraph. The body, the introductory is introduced in the magistrate. That is in the North because it is different from what is obtainable in uh, CPA before and then the ACJ now in most Northern, uh, Southern states. Now, if you look at it now, the format is in the high court is the same thing like the format in the high court in the north, the same thing as the format in the high court in the south. I mean, the federal high court. So it's the same thing. So now I want you to know that despite all these things that I'm saying, that the charge should be uh, drafted uh, concisely, uh, uh, unambiguously, clearly. Otherwise, the charge may be bad. I want us to drop our own knowledge, what we had in law school, because law school is a strict place where they want you to master it. Proficiency is what is required for us in law school. Now, we are proficient, so to say. Now, uh, because even ACG, ACGL of various states came to even resolve most of those problems, that technical objections on the issue of form or issue even of some contents, majorly which were initially an issue, is no longer an issue. That is why I say now section 220, 22 and 221 of ACG and 227, 229 where ACGL of kind of had downplayed all those uh, 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 issue of errors or defect in charge, it, it will end up just uh, being um, uh, uh, deceiving yourself if somebody is going to take those days, you take technicalities on issues of content where some error you now take an objection and then it may even end up in either striking out the charge or whatever. But now ACJA and ACGL I mean, said no, now it's no longer. So this is one, this is uh, mostly in all the states in Nigeria. Now, we all know this thing, rule, rule of duplicity against duplicity, rule against ambiguity, rule against the gender offenses, offenders. Now, they guide against infractions. Now, basically, these are things which were summarized, theories from law school, which we learned. Now, yes, they are there. Yes, they are part and parcel of the system. But I want us to know that most of the time, there are certain things. You know, if you go by what we were taught in law school, that is a rule against the police, the only rule, uh, I mean, ambiguity, is the only rule that has no exception. Now, uh, uh, but uh, uh, you can see now from the provision of section 220 and 221, as I said in ACJ, it has even said, except where the defendant will show that there is miscarriage of justice, or he has been misled. Nothing else. So those these rules are there for us to learn, but in order because the the significance of ACJ came over to sway the problems that we used to have of objections, whereby you see an objection concerning criminal trial going to Supreme Court. I have seen a case there where issue of invitation, so police invitation had taken to the Supreme Court. Yes, 
you can imagine. So SGA came to solve this problem. Now, I want us to know some, take care of something that avoid the pitfalls, avoiding the pitfalls. What do I mean by that? You know, in drafting charges, the prosecutors or the draftsmen, either the police, the EFCC, the state council and what have you, they are doing their best to ensure that the uh, charge is drafted free from ambiguity. Clear, unambiguous. So why do they, why do, they do that? Then they have to bring, uh, bring or provide as much particulars as they could so that they can be able to say that, look, this charge is perfect. So to say in quotes, perfect in quote. So you now find prosecutions going out of their ways to, to, to load a charge with particulars so that they will say, look, I have given them all the required. This is a constitutional requirement. But I, I want to say that the prosecutor do that is doing it at its own period. It's sometimes a very dangerous practice. I'm going to give you one scenario here. That's why I cited the case of Ismail versus State. Uh, the, the first Ismail versus State 2008 one is a court of appeal decision, which uh, the case uh, went to the Supreme Court in 2011, judgment was delivered. And the Supreme Court affirmed the judgment of the High Court and the lower court. Now, this case, I'll give you quickly so that we can be able to understand. It's a case whereby the defendant was alleged to have killed her boyfriend. Um, in, a, uh, in a nutshell, her boyfriend was arrested by police. She heard, she went and rescued him from the, I mean, and bailed him out from the police. But she noticed he had 10,000 Naira then. So she told him, look, we need to go for uh, a, a picnic, kind of. So he said, look, I am dirty. Then they went to her house, uh, his house. He now, he, she was, he hired a taxi for them. So she went into the, he went to the house, dressed and came back and left for, it's, a, it's an outskirt of a canal. So they went to, to take a bath in one of those uh, like uh, picnic areas. So only one person, when they were passing, he now saw one of his friends. Then he now waved at him from the, from the taxi and said, I've gone there somewhere. So that's the only person who saw them. So they went, eventually they went to, uh, on their way, she, she drugged him. She gave him eclairs with a drug. So they entered into a, a, a like kind of pond there where they want to swim. But the guy got drunk, got unconscious, kind of. But now she was pushing him into the water and he came out, he said, I was sleeping, I'm cold. The taxi driver who took them was there, but he now ran away because he felt now, that is the gist of the case. So eventually, um, she killed him there and came back. And then eventually, the story, she was arrested and charged to court. Now, the fact now that the investigative police had led her to where she now took them to the place where she buried him. You could, she could not bury him, but what she did inside the pond, there somewhere like the, where she was able to put him inside and then the body decomposed there because she was able to trick the police and show them the police. Now, because of the story that the, the prosecution were trying to be as clear as possible so that they would be able to secure conviction and they gave the facts and then in the charge, they loaded the charge. You can see from the screen now that uh, you, Rabbi Ismail, all know about the 25th of December of 2020, uh, 2002 at Rum Dam along Tiga Road did commit corporal homicide punishable with death in that you caused the death of one Awal Ibrahim alias Zazu by doing an act to it, dragging him by means of giving him a doped eclairs sweet, as a, result, or as a result of which the deceased lost consciousness and you later pushed him into the dam with knowledge that death will be probable consequence of your act. And you have a committed an offense punishable under section 221B of the penal code laws. Now, look at this charge. In trying to be uh, clear, to ensure that they have given the accused adequate notice, they have now loaded this charge. They now it alluded in the charge that it was because she drugged him. He was drugged. That is why he was killed. But if you look at this charge as it is, there are two things which are likely would are possible. One of those things that could be able to be to be used in proving that somebody has killed, like issue of drugging. If you drug somebody, now it depends. Is it the drug that killed the person? 
Or is it that as a result of the influence of drug, he was incapable of either doing something or defending himself, or he even fell into the water and died himself? This is one likely scenario. The other scenario is that she took him to the uh, dam where she now pushed him into the, 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 the dam and then let uh, cause his death. So now the prosecution were carried over with this drug. So they put it and that's why they will give it a scenario that emotionally that, oh, she drugged him and killed him. Now, the, at the end of the day, the court found that there was no evidence that it was as a result of that drugging the victim. That was why he died. Now, if not because of some certain evidence, if not because of her confessional statement, and where she was taken, there are two principles there also. She was taken, she took the police to the scene where she killed him and showed his cops. Secondly, there, there was confessional statement obtained from her. So this is, was the only saving grace of the, uh, 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 of the, 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 the prosecution. Now, uh, look at it. The judge, in trying to deliver his judgment, he said, having proved its case beyond reasonable doubt, independent of Exhibit 178, which are exhibit that had to do with issue of other drugging and what have you, in that the issue is not much of doing with sweets, to prove is uh, to prove, uh, but drowning the disease, which has been proved as well as weak consciousness of the deceased before drowning, which was attested by PW6. That is the driver, is the PW6. And tangentially alluded by the accused in her reference to deceased being a drunkard who bought Henneken beer. Now, you see, this, if not because the judge had other avenues they would have lost this case because there was no proof that the, 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 the victim uh, was drugged and was killed as a result of that. But because we know it in proof that you must prove the cause of death, the cause of death. You remember if, if we read the case of Shandi and the state, you know, in Shandi's case, there is a case where it happened in Benue and the accused was, was, was alleged to have set her husband and his, uh, his mistress on fire. And there was evidence that she was in the room. There was evidence immediately after she left the room, uh, the fire caught, and she even confessed. But the Supreme Court, in its wisdom, this channel put her on the ground that the prosecution took it for granted. They did not prove the cause of death. So they said, if the cause of death has not been proven, there is no point for even court to proceed in this investigation. Now, the point I'm trying to say is that you can see sometimes because you provide particulars, you take it for granted, and then you'll be able to land yourself in trouble. So you see, that is the, 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 the aspect of why the prosecution would have lost that case, despite they had a confession statement, you know? Now, you see, the defense counsel, who is very clever, who is a legal aid okay. counsel, now was able to look, to notice those pitfalls. So he saw the pit. So he now, one of his grounds, there are two grounds which I just picked out of, there are many, but I just picked these two for our discussion here. In, the, in ground three of the piece, the trial judge Eddie Law, by holding that the, the case against the appellant was not that of drugging, but drowning the deceased. That is, his, you see, it's a pit hole. I mean, it's the loophole he has seen. So now he has taken advantage of those particulars, which they thought they were doing good to themselves and to the accused, that would have caused them a trouble, or caused them the entire case. Look at the second ground. When he moved to a higher court, he now used this ground. Whether the trial court has power to make a new court case for prosecution when the fact adduced was against the weight of evidence at the trial. What the, uh, the, the learned defense counsel was trying to do is, he was trying to sway the mind of the court that, look, the center of this proof was issue of, he, the cause of this was because he was drunk and he died. And the judge made a case different from that of the prosecution. But I will uh, show you how the prosecutor Supreme Court in its wisdom now, from the court of appeal, now brought out the issues and now pointed at how the uh, the the, the defense counsel missed the point. Now, look at saving grace of the prosecution, as stated by Taba JSC at page uh, 609 to 620. Milord said, having regards to the confession and also admission in Exhibit 1 and 7, corroboration was not strictly required. 
to sustain the appellant conviction. The situation notwithstanding, the prosecution still availed the court to several other pieces of evidence that further corroborated the confession and no admission. You know, we know that uh, when we're dealing with confession, that confession alone, uh, you need other factors around to see whether it is possible, it's feasible, it's uh, consistent with the confession. Now, in that regard, your hand said all found in the appellant's possession. That means the, 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 the convict. Now, uh, it was by slight of uh, yes, we are going there, there, there. So that is the one of the saving grace of also the case that where he was the person who now identified her as look, this is uh, it was a taxi he identified. That's a taxi. He said the taxi had one white uh, paint in its uh, bumper, so that's why he was able to trace the taxi and the taxi man now. Uh, 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 trust uh, took the police to this lady and then and on. Now, the point I'm trying to say, you can see that the particulars have landed them into trouble. Now, so uh, 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 as a matter of just line of this area, is that we should see that if not because of other corroborative or other pieces of evidence, I mean, that was uh, were led by the police, uh, by the prosecution, the case would have collapsed as a result of drafting a charge so when the 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 the, the, the i think for, for as far as the draft of charge uh, there are other things i do not intend to exhaust everything but i just want to give us just a highlight of this thing now the next thing is proof of evidence the material contents now this are what are what what what, what is the significance of proof of evidence in the case you know, these are the conglomerates of the list of witnesses, their statements, exhibits, summary of the statement of the witness, and copies of statement of the defendant. That is where a person accused has made a statement. Then a copy of his statement will be there. If there are additional statements, if there are other witnesses, all must be in the case diary. Why do you need that? Because for you to be able to, as we discussed earlier on, to, to draft a charge valid, you have to have this. So now that is that is with regards to this. Now, uh, 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 now also any documents which they intend to rely. For example, now you know that digital evidence as one of those means of proving our cases. Now, if there are other digitally uh, acquired evidence, if there are other documents or materials, weapons, uh, what used for example, and what have you, you all have to have them. And then there's one of those things that would be part of the uh, uh, proof of evidence by way of statement, you know, because you cannot, uh, it, it, it's, it's uh, proof of evidence accompanies the information or charge as the case may be. So now when you are uh, preparing a charge, then you have to have these uh, details so that uh, at least it will be one of part and parcel of those things that will be used by the prosecution or the, or the draft want to draft a charge. Now, proof of evidence, as I said, it is accompanies uh, uh, the charge, and other and uh, you know in other jurisdictions, for example in in Kano, if the proof of evidence is not accompanied with, if the defense counsel raises an objection, and the prosecution will be asked to provide those proof, proofs, whatever, if they don't know, the court will strike out the charge. In some other jurisdiction. They, they will ask, they say the prosecutor, the defense should apply to the court and the court will give you uh, uh, it. Uh, but specifically, Kano made mention and like in, in, in SCG, in SCG in second, uh, 370 and so on. Now, where you fail to apply, it's at your own period. So if a, a defendant is arraigned before court, before he takes a plea, and then there is lacking in this particulars, all he needs to do is to tell the court, I'm sorry, my lord, uh, the, I don't have the proof. I don't even know, understand the charge against me or any information that has been filed against me. Then the court is mandated to direct the prosecution to avail the person because issue of constitutional right and fair hearing. Now, arraignment. Arraignment is the process of where an accused person is put in the dock and asked to plead to, to the charge uh, or an information or an FIR, as the case may be. That um, So without a valid arraignment, there will be no trial, and then there will be an arraignment, then it will be a complete nullity. So 
meaning there is no way that uh, a plea will be dispensed with. Say, no, don't worry, we will do it later. You know, um, once plea is not taken, the entire trial is a nullity. Now, the procedure of arraignment are there, which we know, all know them, that the accused must be unfettered, put in the dock, and then the charge or information be read to the accused person in a language explained and should be explained to, to the defendant. Um, to the defendant, and the defendant will now take a plea. The charge read over, explained to the defendant in the language he understands, to the satisfaction of the court and himself by the reason or any officer appointed by the court. That if he does not understand, you know, that brings in the issue of uh, in an arraignment that the accused must be able to understand the language. If he does not, then the court must provide an interpreter. It's a constitutional right. Now, if the accused pleads, then it means that issues have been joined, then trial will proceed. Now, how should a plea be recorded? A plea is said to be supposed to be recorded in, as nearly as possible in a word or language uttered, in a word uttered by the, defend, the, the defender. So the court should not record something differently from what, and then plea must be made without reasons. My Lord, I, I, I admit that I, however, that plea with reasons. It is invalid, it's not acceptable. Now, there are certain exce exceptions where um, uh, plea uh, uh, arraignment cannot be done. Uh, for example, where the person is taken to court and say, my Lord, I have not been served with the charge. Let's say he's in custody and then he's been taken straight to the court, then uh, the court cannot assume jurisdiction because service is fundamental. Now, that's one of the issues Then you mean, there is objection as to the competency of the trial to go on with him. Now, uh, uh, where accused, despite the fact that he has not been served, he now submits the jurisdiction of the court without raising all these things. And then the court says, then he has now he has to, he has himself, he has put himself through trial. So that he cannot be heard later on to be. Uh, now, taking plea must be taken by the defendant himself. If it were uh, many defendants, then there could be a bulk reading of the charge, but each and every one of them must take plea per each count of the charge or head of charge, as the case may be. So no block plea. Will be taken. There will be maybe block reading, but there will be no block uh, plea taking. Now, uh, where that is where, I pers where uh, persons have been charged jointly. Now, where, for example, there is a defect as a charge, and then the accused person is asked to take a plea. Yes, the accused person may take a plea, and you know, in the old uh, uh, CPS, CPC. If you remember the case of Ikome and the state, the case of Abacha and the state itself, the issue that that uh, defendant that is must raise an objection tenuously before before plea is taken. Once plea is taken, that's the end of story. But now with the introduction of SCJ, it says no. Before anything can be done, you must take plea. This are one of the challenges we are going to discuss in due course. Um, so, uh, if a plea is taken, the defendant may raise objection as to the, the computer charge and whatever, whatever. And then uh, the section of the law is there provided under ACJ and ACGL of Kano, that is it. Now, what are the options open to the accused person where uh, he's been arraigned and then his plea, plea to be taken? You know that this bar, plea of atropos acquit, atropos convict, pardon. These are three things which we know. And then he can be able to raise this thing and then he may, he may not be asked to take a plea. Now, it's, uh, uh, what was the situation whereby a defendant is put to dock and refused to talk, refused to take, to, I was asked, are you guilty or not guilty? Kept quiet. Now we know the procedure. It's, uh, it's, it's something that you see is elementary, but it is happening day to day. Of recent, there was a case which um, I was uh, one of the prosecution counsel that uh, uh, a very serious uh, uh, charge was read against the uh, defendant. He kept quiet. Then the court had to order for his uh, mental uh, status be determined, and also his whether he is here has a problem or not. And then, it, then the police, the 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 the, the uh, prison services, that is the correctional service center, now took the uh, the defendant to court, and then the brought came back and said he's well. And then later on, he came back and was talking, and then trial go on, went on. I mean, if but where he now refused to talk. And then uh, the court will now have to ascertain, you know, it whether the the mutinous is a result of visitation of God. That is is something which is natural, or is malice. Where it is visitation of God, then the court will now take the necessary steps in determining whether it is a mental illness or whether it's deaf or dumb. If it's a deaf or dumb, the court will try to see whether he can be able to follow. If not, then the court will now um, 
uh, it, it, it may not be possible for the trial to go on, then he may be kept uh, in an asylum. And now, but where it is as a lot of malice, the court will call a plea of not guilty to that uh, defendant, which we know. Now, that is a deliberate withholding of plea. The court may ask the accused his reason. If he refused, then the court will just record a plea of not guilty and proceed with the trial against the, the, the defendant. Now, uh, Now, um, uh, if, for example, a defendant is real and charged to and pleaded guilty, now the point is that whether court will proceed to convict the person depends upon the circumstance and nature of the case. Where the case involves, for example, needing a proof from the from scientific means, for example, issue of drug or issue of scientific thing, that the court will not proceed to convict the person until when the prosecution were able to prove those things. For example, if you are suspect about to be using cannabis, then the prosecution must prove that that drug is the is cannabis itself, not anything else. Otherwise, the court uh, would uh, that would have convicted the accused be on doubt. So, and then where the accused also or the defendant pleaded guilty, then the, the plea, the court must look that must be consistent with what he has made to the police. He has made statements to the police, and then he came and then pleaded something differently. Then the court would look at it. Because at the end of the day, they will ask the prosecution to proceed and prove their case. Now, where a case is uh, capital in nature, <clears throat> simple, the court will record a plea of not guilty, even if the accused plea is guilty, because the duty of the prosecution to prove the case beyond reasonable doubt. Now, the, the plea in capital offenses, as, as I explained, uh, there are certain times when an accused person will plead guilty, he will be asked to plead guilty, he will plead guilty to another charge, different from the one that he has been charged to court. Now, in there are two uh, 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 two parallel positions. In in ACJA, where he pleads, if you read it by implication, the court will now uh, 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 consider that second charge and then proceed with the hearing. But in respect, uh, and they will ask them to amend the charge. But in ACJL canon, I guess <clears throat> what they will do is they will just convict him there and then, and then. Uh, proceed and ask the prosecutor to amend the charge and continue with the other charge. Now, um, I, I, uh, let me just jump to now incidental applications, which are part of what we are going to cover. Now, the, the presumption is that a defendant is brought before a court of law and then let's say plea has been taken. Uh, I'm going back, or we'll go back to the issue of challenges of section 202, but let's say now the, the accused or the defendant has been put uh, to trial, he has denied and then uh, and pleaded not guilty. And then what are the incidental applications? There could be several of them. You know, issue of summons, for example, to bail and motion. You know, as we know it, uh, 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 it is the, by the authority of similarly and the state and the, uh, the, uh, the 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 procedure of applying for bail in the south is by way of summons, and then that is now in the SCG. In the, but in the north, you can use both. That is asking for the accused, I mean, for the defendant to be allowed to go home pending the trial, depending upon the nature of the offense. Now, the the essence of bail is for him because he's presumed innocent. Now, what are the facts factors to be considered by the by the, by the by the I mean, in trying to do, look at this, then you have to look at the affidavit. And then the fact that you're going to post to the affidavit and give the court reason why the court should grant bail to the, of course, bail is is, uh, is, 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 is at the discretion of the court. Now, where issue of bail uh, is uh, involved, now the, you must make sure that you have a competent and valid affidavit. Because I remember a trial that had happened in, in one of these federal high courts, I was there that EFCC was the one responding. The prosecutor of EFCC was able to successfully attack the entire affidavit, entire. The court found there was no affidavit before the court. Now, too bad that the defendant was left without any affidavit to support uh, the, 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 the summons or whatever the bail application. So uh, this, uh, there are factors which must be considered, which we all, I believe we all know them then the condition of bail that you try to uh, navigate through, just like what yesterday in police uh, uh, bail after arrest, is just the same thing in court. You have to also 
try to ensure that uh, all the available facts are there, you are able to convince the court that you bring a reasonable level surety and that the accused will attend his trial and that the accused has never committed an offense and that he was a first offender, whatever, whatever. And then all those things, you challenge those uh, facts. Now, the other aspect uh, 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 is the issue of challenge of competence of charge vis-a-vis -vis the implication of section, vis-a-vis uh, -vis section 309 of section 2 of ACG where it says that where an, a defendant is charged before a court of law and where the, 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 there's an objection as to the competence of the charge, the court says, okay, all you need to do is just take a plea and then you may raise the objection and then the court will reserve its ruling until when it is going to deliver its substantive uh, uh, judgment. Then that is when uh, 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 you, the court will decide. Now, one of the issues that one will look at it is, now let's assume uh, 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 there is a case whereby an accused, uh, our defendant is taking over court of law and there is an issue of abuse of court process by the prosecution. Should the accused person undergo trial when there's an abuse of court process? Should the court allow its process to be abused by the prosecution simply because ACG a or ACG of their states said no, leave the objection. What of contempt of court? Should the prosecution be allowed to proceed when they're in contempt of court? When we know that a contempt no should, has no right of hearing until he purchases himself of those queries, I mean of those contempt, uh, no, no, regardless of the, the, the aspect of argument or whether the issue of jurisdiction has been when you are challenging competent jurisdiction of court, it means there's no and on and on. But these are issues to be considered. Now, what of issue of substantive jurisdiction? Should Accused person be allowed or the defendant take plea? Should he take a plea? And then when, for example, there is an abuse, should the court now ask him, okay, take a plea? Because why I, uh, I think it's a very good thing that uh, the, 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 this issue is being put part of what we are going to discuss by the Institute is that we face this kind of challenges. I have personally faced it that I, before a court of law that uh, we have had a, an order of, of court, yet the prosecuting agency now arraign the person. Now, if there is an order to restrain them, can a court sister or well, court of ordinary jurisdiction now proceed and hear this application or hear this charge and take plea? Or say, okay, take plea. And then it's not, isn't the court now not guarding its own jurisdiction? What of there is contempt? What of if the jurisdiction of the court is substantively being a, a, a challenge, for example, well, a, a, a person, a attorney general of a state or a federation, let's say, charge somebody before a state high court with an offense of theft. Should the court say, okay, simply because section 392 say, 96 of 2 say, you should wait, then you should wait to abuse the court process, and then the right of the defendant has been uh, infringed because nobody should be put under rigor trial because it's degraded and human treatment. So the point is that these are the challenges that. How do you go about it? Do we just watch it and then watch it? And should the court allow its process to be abused? Now I tell you a case. Now here comes a case whereby the defendant has gone to court to enforce his right. And then there's an interim order given that he should not be arraigned before court. He should not, they should not take any further step, but yet the defendant was arraigned. Now should the court now allow those kind of things to happen? These are the kind of challenges that 3962 is whereby you find some people now always trying to, the, uh, particularly some uh, prosecution agencies, they are circumventing this kind of thing, and then they will leave you lawyer struggling, helter skelter, trying to say, look, there is a case. And if you don't get a judge who may be proactive, who may be able to guard his jurisdiction, because I was in one of the matters, and the judge insisted that the accused, that is the defendant, must take a plea. What, what can you do in that circumstance? My Lord said, you must take a plea. What can you do? Will you tell him, no, my Lord, he will not. Of course, you know. So, but, you know, of course, it's wrong law, in my view, that because there's an order of a court, that process ought not to have proceeded. So it's just like, look at the provision of 396. One said the defendant be tried on an information or charge shall be arraigned in accordance with the provision of this act related to taking plea, meaning, Three six is making that that you have to take plea before you raise any objection, and then judgment will be delivered after 
the substantive matter has been heard. So it means I believe it is does not serve the interest of justice. There are cases where it's so many things have been said against where there is an abuse of court process. Court should not move an inch. Court should stop. But yet it's a challenge that we are still facing. Now, what of issue of contempt? When there is a contempt, we know what the court says in case of governor of Lego State versus Ujuku. What the court said that that um, no under no circumstances where the court order is given. Everybody must obey. Nobody should flout a court order. You, you know what had happened in that case. Now, what are issue of jurisdiction, competency of the... Now, you are talking... I want you to ask to distinguish clearly issue of substantive jurisdiction and other procedural jurisdiction. Where I believe there is an order of courts that do not proceed, I believe it has gone to substantive jurisdiction, apart except under certain circumstances. But, you know, example where the, the AG has no power even to prosecute under that law, for example, like uh, in case of uh, AG's uh, state prosecuting federal offenses, you know, he has no power. So why should the court say, okay, wait until when we finish the timing? That would be against the spirit of justice. And then, uh, or you file a case, like I explained, against interim order, why is an interim order? Uh, I believe um, with this few things that I'm able to at least put out something for us to have uh, this. So thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. And that is my presentation. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Nasiru Aliyu, the NSC Advocate of Nigeria. Brilliant presentation. Uh, I'll make my comments at the end. But in the interim, I'll invite um, Docs Onyeke, if he's still here, to give his comments. Docs, are you still here? Still not. Um, Tola Oshubi, Senior Advocate of Nigeria. Tola, are you there? Yes, I am. Okay. Do you have any comments to make? Uh, I, I, I don't have any comments. Just to thank Prof for his uh, very good presentation. Thank you very much for the. I thank you very much for the insights. Um, if I don't have any comments for now, thank you. Okay, I'll invite uh, Maya will I be for to do the question time, and Maya, if you have any comments, you can make them whilst you take questions. Maya, are you there? Yeah, to me, I'm here. All right, good. Prof, uh, before I go into the questions, I'd also like to thank you very profoundly on behalf of the ICLE for that well-delivered um, uh, uh, topic. Um, you covered the field in so many ways. We have so many questions in the questions and answer room. I would proceed to take them, as many of them as we can take before we run out of time. Um, now, this question, sir, is from Friday Ramses or Noja. Um, he's requested that can a person be charged in respect of the same fact in two distinct counts under different laws? Uh, Prof, I'm just going to repeat that question again. It yes. says, can a person be charged in respect of the same fact in two distinct counts under different laws? Yes. Um, where a person, these are one of the exceptions in drafting a charge. Where a person uh, is charged under, under same facts but different laws, you can charge that person however. However, he could only be convicted for one. So it's an, one of those exceptions to the rule of drafting a charge. You charge them, these are instances where, for example, um, uh, it's easier, the, the ingredients, it's easier to prove a case, for example, under, let's say, uh, uh, road traffic offense than under uh, 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 criminal code or penal code. So if you are able to now charge under two distinctly, now you can be charged, but you can only be convicted for one. Yeah, thank you very much, Prof. Um, Jamil Saeed um, wants you to clarify whether criminal cases or criminal offenses have limitation periods. Prof, um, the question is, uh, do criminal cases have limitation periods? Sorry, the line went off, the line went off. Okay, I'm going to repeat the question. This question size from uh, a colleague of ours called Jamila Sahad. Uh, you would like to know whether criminal cases have limitation periods? Of course, there are certain cases that limit, they have limitation. There are those that don't have limitation. For example, offenses of def defamation, you know, slander, there are time limits depending upon also some state laws. So there are certain offenses, it's not like at large, 
that certain times when some offenses may have uh, a limitation that are some we don't have. Okay, thank you very much, Prof. Um, quite a number of people are asking that uh, uh, for the slides, <laughs> that's a reflection of how much they've enjoyed um, the, the session. Um, I'm going to answer that question on behalf of Davina. I know that there's a customary pattern that the slides are usually shared um, on the WhatsApp platforms at uh, various levels and also shared by email. So if you're registered for this training and you register with your email, you would get the slides sometime soon, probably over the course of the weekend or early next week. Now, Prof, I'll go on to the next question. This question is from Obi Anoye. Um, he would like to know that if an accused refuses to take a plea for not being cited by the prosecution with uh, the charge prior to the hearing, can he apply for bail at that point? Prof, I'm going to take the question again. Well, you know, yes. Okay, it looks like you got it. Yes. I just wanted to be sure you got it. That's why I was trying to take it. If you want me okay. to take it again, okay. just so take, take, it again. take it again. Yeah, yes. it says if an accused yes. refuses to take a plea for not being served by the prosecution uh, before the arraignment, can he apply for bail? Well, I think in my view, you know, um, the court has not take, take, co taken cognizance of the offense. So um, why, what, on what basis would he take, uh, I mean, apply for bail? Because the court has not taken cognizance of the offense. And then it's only when a plea is read and then court has taken cognizance, then the court will now act. It. Even if, except if it is for the purpose of remand proceedings, that is something else. Okay, so I think, you know, that is one of the issues that have been seen as a challenge in things. You know, when in, in, in the CPC uh, 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 period, there was this application for leave to purify a charge. You know, you see prosecution now taking accused to the, to the court and putting him in the dock. When, you know, we know the requirement of leave that before, leave to purify a charge and consent to file an information. Without those things obtained, okay. you just take an accused and put him in the dock. When the court has not taken cognizance, because what if the judge says, you "No, know, the leave is hereby refused," he has no order to make. He will not say, "Okay, you go away." You understand? So that is the similar situation. Thank you very much, Prof. Uh, quite a number of people are asking for your contact details. I'm certain that, um, uh, with your permission and leave, uh, the chairman of the ICL would probably oblige them. They are already saying they would like to consult you privately for some. As my uh, chairman. Please. As my chairman, <laughs> uh, I reckon the chairman will decide whether to share your details, sir. Um, this question, yes. sir, is from Omfri Usha. He says, what is the wisdom or legality behind the filing of a bail application for a defendant who is on administrative bail but has been served with a charge? I, I think the way the question has been phrased is a bit um, unwieldy, but what I think he's trying to say is that, is it, is it prudent or wise to file a bail application uh, before um, a person is arraigned in court, um, that's that's the question. Yes, I think. Yes, I think once a person is stabbed with a charge, you know, because to avoid sometimes the mischief of our colleagues, uh, the prosecutors, and eventually you go to court and then um, you don't have a bail application, the judge might not be able to be disposed to say, okay, since you're an administrative bail, go and continue administrative bail. So it's better. Once you've been served with charge, file your application for bail so that it will be right for hearing by the time you are in court. So that's yeah, the wisdom. That, that, yeah, I, I, I agree totally with you, Prof. Um, but it was important that you answered it because it looked like a question that had already answered itself. Now, Prof, there's a question yes. here. He says that um, uh, a colleague of us who's registered as an anonymous attendee um, would like to know whether it is compulsory for every person listed as a witness in an information um document to have made statements at the police station to be um to be to be uh, uh, eligible to be presented in in court i'll take that again you would like to know whether every every witness that is listed on information sheet is required to have made a statement at the police station okay no 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 i think the prosecution has the prerogative of if they want they call all if you don't want they call the material witness they think they'll prove their case it's not necessary. Um, it is only required where a statement has been made for the purpose of contradicting a person where his statement is made and not been produced, then you now have to subpoena that person when you think the statement is uh, vital to your case. Otherwise, you are not, the police, uh, prosecution are not obliged.
to call all the witnesses they have listed. Thank you very much, Prof. Um, some of those questions have been repeated, so I'm trying to see through questions that already looks like you've already answered already in the course of um, this session. Um, Now, uh, a colleague of ours called Mukenke Sim Simdon would like to know, how can one draft a charge against a nominal complainant on the same facts in the same court? Is this possible? Um, Prof, I don't know whether you can make sense of that question because it's a bit confusing for me. Yes. How can one draft a charge against a nominal complainant on the same facts in the same court? Is it possible? Uh, I, I, th I think this is hypothetical. It's not possible because- It's not even possible. How will you file a charge against the complainant? I, I don't to, yeah, yeah. Now, there's um, Sedon Nongo would like to know, what is the difference between a charge and a complaint? Is there actually a difference? And does the provision well, of yes, section of 209 of the ACJ, uh, is it applicable to the charges also ap applicable to complaints? So you know- I'll repeat uh, the question, sir. Okay. What is the difference between a charge and a complaint? And does the provision of section 209 of the ACJ, uh, is it applicable to charges and also to complaints? No, I think that section 209 is applicable to complaints. Now, complaint, um, you know, um, it started from, uh, there's an old case called DPP versus Aluko. This is a situation whereby even complaints, you know, the problem started when filing a charge, whether, a complaint can be filed, for example. I'm just trying to trace a history kind of so that I will get to the point. Like whether you can file a complaint before high court, a complaint, ordinarily, not a charge, not an information. Now, in under the old regime, under CPL, which uh, related to CPA, that a complaint, you know, is nothing other than allegations of uh, a crime committed against somebody. But written in a cannot in a formal way that like a formal charge or an FIR is just like a direct complaint kind of you like under section I think uh, 135 of the uh, CPC or before now and then I cannot remember now under CPL of Kano or of uh, Kano or whatever that you can file a complaint a complaint is just a mere allegation that you file as a person or an attorney general you file a complaint but the complaint as it is, uh, is almost the same thing as a charge, except if the formatting, except on who files it. You know, an attorney general can commence a case by way of complaint. But uh, also a private person, you can file a complaint, for example, under ACJL that you have a complaint, you file it, and then the, the, the criminal summons will be issued to the defendant. And then where, for example, in, in, in ACGA ale of uh, Northern States that a complaint is filed for a magistrate, the magistrate will look at the complaint and then he will now ask the, the, the defendant, the person that is uh, who has been summoned before the court. And then he comments, he says, yes, I agree. I, I, I know it's true. Then where it can be, can be summarily dealt with the magistrate will. If not, the magistrate will not refer the matter to the police for investigation. So a complaint, complaint is almost, it's not a charge per se, but it's almost uh, uh, you can call complaint, for example, under SCGL in the most like um, just an ordinary, um, uh, 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 what can you say? Not an FIR. FIR is initiated by police as provided under the law, but just um, an issue that you want to bring to the court for the court to determine. That is uh, as far as the best I can say. Thank you very much, Prof. Now, um, Charles Okafo would like to know. Um, whether a defense counsel can apply for a charge to be struck out for lack of evidence before the prosecution has opened its case or called any witnesses? No, I don't, don't think so. I don't think you do as such. Well, you, you know, when you, you can apply an application to court a charge, um, but, uh, you know, under the, what was uh, 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 obtainable before, that if there's a charge for a court of law, then, like I told the case of Ekome and the state, you know, that you file an application to court charge because it does not disclose any reasonable uh, uh, offense against the defendant. Now, but the problem now is one of the challenges now you are facing is that uh, uh, SCJL says, okay, whatever you have concerning defect in, in the charge, because you will not be able to say there is no evidence 
because simply because they said we are going to call this, we are going to call this. It's after maybe the evidence would have been heard. Then that is why then at that level, you may be able to make a new case submission or to you even rest your case on that of the prosecution where you believe the facts are not sufficient even to convict you. Or in fact, all they support even your case. Uh, thank you very much, Prof. This other question is similar to what you just answered now. So I'll just, I'll just react to it, even though it's phrased in a different way. Um, Honor Francis Oliko would like to know uh, that if proof of evidence is very important to, um, in any criminal charge, why is it that in most cases the proof is not always there? Can the answer, absence of proof be a ground for caution of the charge? No, no, no. I think except if you have applied for and they have not given to you, and then that is where, now it's not at the peril, that if there is no proof of evidence attached to it, it depends. Like I told you, in, in, in uh, I cited uh, the section of ACJ L and ACJ, which says that a document, must, uh, a charge must be accompanied with proof. Now, if there's no proof, it means the charge is not uh, a competent, so to say. But usually, you know, you can apply for the proof be given to you. Or otherwise, um, I think issue, it centers around issue of fair hearing and constitutional issue. Thank you very much, Prof. Uh, Ni Odose would like to know uh, what the position with trial is in the absence in, of, the, of the accused person under the ACJL. Where the defendant refuses to attend court at all, can the court proceed with trial? I think there are the instances where uh, trial in absentia is, I think, on intellectual applications, then that can be taken, uh, except um, uh, 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 in that circumstance, I cannot remember really that there is a provision for Doc is here, he would give us uh, insight if there's any, that uh, an accused could be tried in absentia. Um, if not in such seconds, I told you intellectual applications, you can take it without the accused being in court. But where he has been asked, then the court will now issue a warrant or a bench warrant against that uh, tender. I can also. So Kelvin Tiku wants Prof to confirm whether in your, in your experience, you've seen a situation where there are two conflicting statements made by an accused person, um, which contradict one another, one admitting the, the offense and the other denying it. What would the court do in such circumstances? He wants to know whether you've come across such a situation before. Yes, yes. I came across situations whereby you, you find two conflicting statements of the defendant or accused, so to say. You know, most likely you find in an additional statement that his statement would change from what he had said before. Maybe he would have, in the first place, he would have said, no, I'm not guilty. And then he gave a story of what had happened. Possibly the police will now maybe induce him or convince him or even threaten him or even torture him. And then he'll now come and make another statement. This is a very common thing. It has happened so many times. I have seen them. And then in that circumstance now, it's a matter of now uh, evidence now. When it's now, that is, you know, when the, if you say, that is the issue of trial within trial, where it's uh, it is obtainable that okay, now the if it's a confession statement, confession statement, if it's confessional, that is where then there will be issue of determining the 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 voluntariness of the statement, you know. But you know where an accused or defendant says, uh, uh, if he's, he denies, it depends upon the situation. He may deny and say, completely this is not my statement. This is my statement." It means at that instance, the court will now admit both the statements and then at the end of the trial to consider the weight, look at them and see which weight. But if he says, I did it, but this one I was induced, or this one I then that's why issue of trial and trial comes in. You know, the fact and circumstances and proofs would have now given the court the latitude to decide on which way to follow in terms of uh, ascribing probative value to the statements contradictory. Uh, this question, sir, Prof, is from Kasmer Umwe. He says he would like to know what an accused person should do when forced to enter into a plea bargain, uh, especially where it's obvious that the evidence of the prosecution is seemingly weak. Uh, this question is quite vague. I don't know whether Prof wants to take it or whether we should just skip on to the next one. Yes. Um, he wants to know whether an accused person should, should what he should do when forced to enter into a, a plea bargain where it is obvious that the evidence of the prosecution is seemingly weak? Well, I think uh, this is a matter of 
uh, how he, I mean, he himself and his counsel would have seen it. You see, a plea bargain is a decision whereby freely, presumably, that the defendant, the prosecution, would that is with his counsel, would sit down and agree as to. I'm imagining, imagining a situation whereby you will be forced to make a plea bargain. I mean, if uh, you feel that uh, you will make a plea bargain, you will be forced to make a plea bargain. And then, you know, it's a matter of proof, evidence. Uh, you know, I have seen a situation, a case, which is, I believe, I found it in the novel. Somebody entered a plea bargain before a federal high court. And uh, 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 he was alleged to have uh, laundered some money. So they made a plea bargain. After a plea bargain, judgment was entered. And then they conspicate, uh, they, they, you know, instead of, uh, you know, under the old regime that the, uh, before the Money Lender Act is uh, was amended, that they take one fifth. And now they now agreed they took uh, they took uh, less than the, uh, the 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 minimum I, I guess. So after the plea by judgment was entered, the defendant now appealed against the judgment. When they went to before the court of appeal, Kaduna, the court of appeal Kaduna said, "Look," and then what EFCC now cross appealed on that issue. They cross appealed that okay, you you have we have decided to be. At least for the post sake of leave again, and then you now okay. Now we are cross appealing, and then I think court of appeal said, "Look, both of you cannot renege. The, the, the defendant cannot go back and said, I'm no longer interested in leave again, and then you also cannot say because you have allowed to go beyond the minimum permitted by law. So something like that. So you have to navigate and find a way to challenge them. It means you want to you have to file a fresh action and challenge this thing. Thank you very much, Prof. Uh, this question is from an anonymous attendee as well. Uh, he would like to know whether it's mandatory to have a police investigation report as part of the proof of evidence. Well, I, it's, not, it's not mandatory. It's not mandatory. You know, the content of case diary is an exclusive property of the prosecution. So um, police report usually, usually don't, uh, don't uh, you don't see them even in trials. Usually, uh, sometimes uh, where you want to obtain your right to the police, and then it's very difficult for police to give you those kind of reports uh, for, for reasons based not to them. So it's not necessary, it's not mandatory. Thank you very much, Prof. Uh, Prof, the, the, this question is then basically um, a question that flows directly from the topic. Um, it looks like a, an opinion formed by this um, member. Uh, she would like to find out what your opinion is on the issue of female lawyers, especially in the not, not encouraged to deal with criminal litigation directly. Um, it says that she is of the impression that in private practice, female lawyers in the North are not encouraged to deal with criminal litigation. Do, do you have any views on this? Well, if, if I may say, I think it may not be necessarily right. It's not that, uh, I, I think it, it, it's uh, from their, their own uh, perspective and then the way they do it, you know. It's not that there is anything that uh, they are be discouraged or whatever. And in, ironically, you see, most of the, uh, most state council in the North, the best of my knowledge, you find them, they are even female lawyers, most of them. And then I know seasoned uh, 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 female prosecutors, seasoned one, I know. I know some of them who are now high court judges and I know them. So I think, in my opinion, is this a matter of the way things are happening? Not really, because that was. Thank you very much, Prof. So you, your view that, that that opinion is not entirely correct. Um, Adewale Adeshope would like you to please confirm what the status of a fiat given by an AG um, to a law firm is and not a person. He would like you to clarify whether the Attorney General can lawfully give a fiat to a law firm instead of a, of a person? I think simple answer is no. You know, this, this case has been settled because it's not law firm that has been called to the bar. It is the person. So no, I think it's, it's not correct. Thank you, you can't. Thank you very much. Friend. Some of these questions do not flow directly from today's topic, uh, but it appears that everybody wants to throw uh, all the questions that they have your way, Prof. Um, for example, Daniel always wants to know what the fate of a shorty is if the defendant is 
absent on a date adjourned for report of settlement. <laughs> it's one of the things. One of the things. Either he forfeits the bond, and that is why that bond is made, so that uh, the, the authority will use that money. To, uh, and it may the, the magistrate may, you know, I, I, I wrong thing that I have seen them doing, that they just uh, uh, send the uh, shorty to prison is wrong. It's only for them to forfeit the bond once he has fulfilled the bond, not to send him to prison. But mostly, you find the magistrates or the lower judges, uh, uh, high courts, uh, judge, I mean, lawyer, uh, like uh, Sharia courts, customary courts, as far as I know. But uh, a shorty should only be fulfilled the bond. That's all. That's what is required of him. Except, except where there's a clear offense of screen an offender. That is another thing else. Yeah. Thank you very much, Prof. Finally, Prof. Uh, Brain Red Wally would like to know um, whether the law allows a defendant to defend himself if the charge is in respect of a capital offense. Well, I think if you look at uh, SCJA has mandated where a person is charged with capital offense, he must secure a lawyer or one must be secured for him by the court or by legal aid. That it has not been, you know, we came across a case of recent that um, somebody was arranged for a capital offense. And then I was part of the prosecution and uh, 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 he now rejected his lawyer. He had four set of lawyers. He kept on sending them away, sending them away. And then he said he was ready to proceed with his case. Uh, but the, 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 the judge, the magistrate, uh, is actually a, even a, 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 a upper Sharia judge. They said, no, the ACJA has not given me that right. So you have to. Then when he refused, then they secured a lawyer for him. So they, in the capital offense, the law says that you must be a lawyer. Thank you, Prof. Uh, a few more questions are coming in the intervening period. Uh, Bufede Okporu would like to know whether the confessional statement of an accused person can be used against a co-accused person. Uh, both for the authorities of the unity by in Abuja. Okay, no, 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 no. You know, a confession of an accused is only binding him, not co-accused. In fact, uh, uh, if prosecution sometimes want to use an accused, they cannot use his confession statement. You know, the, the accused must be either convicted and then he'll come and give evidence against, or he may be used as a prosecution witness. They may drop a charge against him, but you cannot use uh, a, a, a confession or co-accused to bind the other no. Thank you very much, Prof. Um, we've um, come to the end of the questions. Um, somebody just sent in one last one, Prof. I promise. It looks like they're, they're yeah, trickling. Yeah. Um, and since we still have a bit of time, I, I think we should oblige them, sir. Um, yeah. Anbali Abdurrahman Yusuf would like to know uh, whether a nominal complainant can withdraw the case um, in court in a criminal matter. Sorry, the line was cracking, so I could at least. Yes. Ambali Abdurrahman Yusuf would like to know whether a nominal complainant has the powers to withdraw the case in court in a criminal matter. It depends. Where is a compoundable offense? If it's a compoundable offense, yes, he can withdraw. Where it's not compoundable, he cannot. You know, if, for example, we charge somebody with mischief destroy their car, and then nothing happened to anybody that was doing anything. And then you now said, look, I intend to compound it. I withdraw. Then it's, uh, that's your own prerogative, not any other offense. OK, thank you very much, Prof. Now, uh, Sidon Nongo would like to know what the position of the law is, where an accused upon arraignment makes his plea uh, in a language other than the language he elected to speak. And understand the Sorry. Can, you, can you take it again? Can you take it again? Please? Sorry, the, 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 I haven't read it, uh, Prof. It, it, it really the concrete. It, it doesn't read well, sir. So I'm, I'm going to skip that question. Okay. Now, Nengi Fatoki would like to know whether a person whose statement was not taken under caution can be charged to court and prosecuted based on such statements which were issued uh, on caution. Nothing will stop the police from charging him. Nothing. Nothing. There's nothing. So invariably, if 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 if, uh, 
if a, if an accused person um, had gone to the police station and made the statement um, voluntarily without being under caution, that statement can still be used against him in criminal proceedings. Well, admissibility is another thing. You are talking of whether he can be arraigned in court. Whether you are going to use that one, you know, you know that goes to issue of even arguing issue of judge's rule and what have you. When it comes to issue of admissibility of a statement where it was not made under caution, you understand. Uh, but that does not stop simply because the police did not. If I want, for example, police now ask you to make statement. It, it's all right. We can decide to say I'm not making a statement. Then it's like for the police to investigate and charge you without even a statement. You understand? So that's yes, that. That cannot be used against you uh, in court as if. It, You're frozen. Bob, you are frozen when you were answering the question. Okay, what I said. Hello? Yeah, you're live now, Prof. We couldn't hear you for a minute. You're back up now. Okay, so sorry. Um what I was saying is that uh the fact that uh as somebody has uh, made a statement not under caution will not prevent the police from charging that person. However, what I'm saying is that may, uh, that statement cannot be used against him for the purpose of trial because statement can be made even where it is uh, where statement is made i say it's, it is now uh, boils down to issue of judges rule which you know the position of judges rule in nigeria concerning issue of a statement uh, obtained without caution you know is you know the statement as stated by supreme court concerning whether Judges who must be abided or not, so must be abided uh, with. Now the point is that he may went and made statement voluntarily, and then not under caution. Nothing will stop police from charging you, but they cannot use that one against you because um, you, you are not put under caution. Thank you very much, Prof. Um, it's obey Long John as passionately appeal that we go back to something you just said now in the course of answering one question. Um, you would like to know uh, the difference between compoundable offenses and non-compoundable offenses. You would like you to expatiate on it. What I said, you know, offenses that are compoundable are those offenses that the complainant has the right to withdraw unfettedly. I give you an example, you know, uh, like if you go to uh, the schedules to the, in, in CPC before and penal code, there are offenses which they say they're compoundable. I'll give you an example. Mischief. You came out with your uh, uh, Nokia phone. Somebody just take it away from you and smash it and it got uh, broken. And then the police, you know, you reported the police charged the person. And then without any other third parties uh, being affected. And then you now let us say, look, I'm no longer interested. That's a compoundable offense. So you can compound this kind of offenses. Compoundable offenses are those offenses which the, the complainant that is a nominal complainant that will say, look, I'm no longer interested. So the police, uh, it may be compounded by the court. I hope I've explained his. Yeah, thank you very much, Prof. Um, Hi, Shai, I would like to know whether um, in instances where an accused person has given his statement in another language, which was translated into English language, um, whether the prosecution can validly tender the translation alone without the original statement? No, no. You see, where a statement is obtained in one language and translated into another language, that statement alone is hearsay, except if the other vernacular in the other language is brought together. Otherwise, but, you know, it's a different thing. This is one of the issues that we used to get ourselves uh, entangled with, where the defendant uh, uh, the police uh, in, investigator is asking you in, 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 in for example, in, in, in Yoruba language, and then he is now writing it in English language. That, per se, if he reads you and you agreed and you endorse, that, there is nothing wrong in that one. But where you have obtained it in one language, you cannot tender the translated version without the other way to be here. See. There are so many Supreme decisions on that. Thank you very much, Paul. Uh, it looks like we're coming to the end of this. Um, I want to
questions? Um, Ari, Kurt Jaffa would like to know, sir, can a defendant who has not been served a charge be compelled by warrant of arrest or, or bench warrant to appear in court? Well, I think except where the court is misled. Where a court is misled, that is where you find those circumstances. Um, but I believe judges usually are, are very careful, usually very careful that uh, they look at the, the proof or affidavit uh, filed by the bailiff of the court or whatever, or the police, whether it, whether it is someone, or the police, uh, leave the police are directed to serve the charge. And then they, they come back and say, look, we have, we have served him. And then came with maybe an impression as inducement. Then the judge, you know, may not know. But that, those are the kind of situations where easily the court sets aside those kind of warrant of I mean, bench warrants. So, you know, I don't think without being served, he can be arrested as such. Thank you very much, Prof. Well, I'm just trying to see the questions are still trickling and some of them have been answered already. So I'm trying to ensure that there's no repetition. Um, Now, Sulaiman Alabi uh, would like to confirm whether uh, a judge has the powers to sentence a convict to a full calendar year as against the prison yearly counting, which is not up to a year. Is there any discretion there or the, the, the uh, statutory uh, definition of a year, is, is it statutory or is there a discretion? I think you, you find mostly judges when they sentence, they sentence somebody to 12 calendar months, for example, uh, uh, six months or whatever. Now, why he does that? You know, if you find it from the Correction Service Center, going by the Correction Service Act, you find they have a way of calculating the, 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 the terms. You may be one calendar year, and then they, when you go there, you find how they do their calculations. Otherwise, the judge has power. To what once it is within the 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 limit of the the, the time he has a part to either the twelve calendar months or twelve months whatever he says then it will go based on the calculation in the National Question Service Act. Thank you very much, Prof. Benjamin a year ago from Oji River Branch would like to know whether an accused person can be convicted for an offence of armed robbery when the object used in the robbery was not standard. Well, the issue is uh, whether an accused can be convicted for an offense where, for example, the object, the weapon used, for example, is not found. There's a yes. lot, of, lot of authority which says that notwithstanding that, um, for example, a murder weapon has not been found, it would not stop the court from convicting him if there are other evidence that could support the court to convict the person. Uh, you know, uh, every, uh, all this kind of is a matter of the, the one, the charge, the evidence adduced, you know, like the, the example I gave us, I hinged, uh, you, you I hinged the crime with an object that was used. Now, uh, 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 you, you, you may be convicted for, you may lose a case if, for example, you hinge it, for example, you, you said that you, 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 somebody hit, somebody uh, like the accused hit the victim with a heavy iron. You understand of about let's say seventy kg kilogram, let's say for that, and then eventually um, the 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 injury is not commensurate to the in terms of circumstances of that to the to the to the, uh, the, the 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 object said to be used. I think there is one case. I think uh, it's called um, Kato Adamu versus uh, I think uh, Bauchinetu Authority. You know the allegation was that. The person hit the person with a mortar, which is heavy, and then he knew the, that the act was probable. But the issue was that because of failure to, to give evidence concerning the actual weight and the, the, the object, that has uh, affected the trial. But now the point is that so we are... There will be doubt concerning the issue. Of, it could be robbery. But not armed robbery.
Switch weapon, gun, I believe it will be difficult. Prof, are you, are you there? Yes, I'm there. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Um, to be honest, at this point, I'm going to hand over to you. Uh, we've come to the end of the questions that we have, even though we still have a bit of time. Uh, what do you advise that we continue to go on because the questions keep trickling in? Some of them are, are repetitions of questions that we've had before, and some of them are, are not entirely relevant. Thank you, so Can I turn it around and excite the power of another prosecutor at Appellate Court? And I know those questions are not relevant or directly connected to today's session, but I'm sure that the person who asked it probably had a case in court that is trying to win some house. <laughs> <laughs> so, so Prof, what, what has happened here is that we you must have noticed from the range of questions that you've been asked to answer, uh, most of them are not connected to the topic that you've shared today. I've but, uh, but, but our colleagues obviously would not uh, uh, want to miss the opportunity to tap from your wealth of wisdom. Um, I have skipped some of the questions. Uh, I've had to exercise a bit of discretion, uh, <laughs> but I, I was constrained to ask you some of them. So I apologize that we've had to put you on the spot uh, to mm -hmm. ask you questions not connected to the topic. Um, uh, to me, I, at this point, I'm going to hand over to you. All right. Thank you very much. Or, um, I'd like to invite uh, Educat Doc Sonyeke for his comments. Docs, I called you earlier on, but it appeared that you'd uh, stepped out for a second. Um, can you give us your comments on the presentation? And there are there any things you, need, you think you need to add to what Prof has done today? Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, Prof, let me first of all, um, behalf of everybody that is here, because I know that uh, we all thoroughly enjoyed ourselves. I, for a moment, I, I, I was trying to bring out uh, my notebook and pen because you transported me back to those days in the classroom where you have, <laughs> where you have a, a professor talking and you are enjoying. Uh, is lecture, you don't know which one, what to just what to do. Honestly speaking, I think Prof uh, did justice to the to this uh, topic. Uh, I, I he went above and beyond in trying to make it so comprehensive. And sincerely speaking, uh, there is nothing he didn't cover with respect to that initial areas of charge, arraignment, incidental applications that go with such a situation. And for me. Uh, this is the beauty of our profession, where practical aspects of our of what we see in court is brought by practitioners with experience and put into the system for those who are willing to to learn to see that what has been taught in form of theory, the practical as aspect of it, the infusion of cases into some of these things, which are matters that have been decided, also made it very interesting. I, I don't want to taint the process by saying more than what Prof has done. When, when Prof has said something, I think we should all agree that uh, there's no room for further improvement. <laughs> but on a more serious note, Prof did a lot to, the, to this topic, and I'm most glad. I would only just say that um, there, was a, there was a question, or rather, I don't know, I think during the presentation, he mentioned something about... Uh, identifying who should be a witness. Uh, I made a note that I was going to just put a little bit of support because I had a, an experience in that respect some time ago where the prosecutor chose to charge everybody. After the investigation, he chose to charge everybody. In fact, I've had two very uh, remarkable experiences in that respect. One, I think in 1997, and one just recently, I think in 2015 or thereabouts, where the prosecutor charged everybody. Now, the challenge the prosecutor now had was that he didn't have anybody that could corroborate some of the stories that he needed the court to believe as the events that uh, the acts of, that were committed by the principal parties. So towards the end of the case, he started granting immunity to some of the defendants so that he could turn them into, <laughs> into uh, uh, witnesses. And this 
of course, we know the implication of this kind of situation where people who have already be who are defendant, who had even finished, where the prosecutor has exhausted the list of his witnesses, are now being turned into defendants. Uh, they are denied at certain points making certain statements or deny the facts against them. And now you are turning back to say, oh, those deniers were just deniers. Now, nah, this is the truth. Those kind of things are not really a proper way. You must know amongst the, the several witnesses, you uh, persons you have who are suspect, who you can charge and those who you can make witnesses, especially those who the whole issue is revolving around them with less culpability. It's always the best person to use as a witness so that there will be nothing like, oh, yes, evidence or those kind of things that the defense counsel can use to make nonsense of the prosecution case. So I think that was just all I wanted to just add to it. About and large, Prof touched every issue and I'm really glad to have sat through this session. So that was you as uh, a defense attorney uh, giving expo to the prosecutors on what they shouldn't do, but that's fine. Quite right, acceptable. <laughs> <laughs> That's why we have these conversations. It's all in the interest of justice, isn't it? Um, Prof, I must say a very big thank you to you on behalf of the MBA Institute of Continuing Legal Education. I'm sure that that thank you must come to you as funny because you're a member of the board yourself and, and uh, one of the people who, are, who, who make these things happen. But thank you very much, Prof. I, have, we talk, I thoroughly myself enjoyed the presentation. And from the comments coming through the chat box, you can see that it was very engaging, very entertaining. People were coming up with their comments, uh, but we're very grateful for the very lucid way with which we presented it. And it was very practical. I mean, I, it's a good thing that you're both an academic and someone that is all in the court all the time as an advocate. So I think all of that came through today in this presentation. And the slides are very lengthy, so that's very helpful. I'm sure those will be used as resource materials for people uh, further down the line just to go through them and know and, and remind themselves of what they learned today. So thank you very much, Prof. Thank you for, for being here. I'm grateful also to Dr. Sonyeke for sitting through the session. Cordelia Eke was here earlier on. Thank you very much. Uh, Paul Ocean, the Senior Advocate of Nigeria. Thank you very much. My role will be Sarah Adijola. And to all the... Um, all the colleagues who participated today, thank you very much. Um, I mean, it was testament to Prof. Delivery that the uh, session was filled to capacity and there were a lot of people viewing through um, uh, YouTube. I mean, from my records, about 3,500 people participated in today's session. So that's really good. Thank you very much for everything and, and God bless you. Uh, tomorrow, the session tomorrow will start at uh, 12 noon with Mrs. Cordelia Eke uh, making the presentation. And I encourage everyone to log in on time. And then it's a Saturday session. We'll finish at about 2 p.m. and then move on. So thank you very much, everybody, and uh, God bless.